I always find it, I find it like like someone who's a more, more retired going to university. I always find that. Oh, what, you know, um, did you join the like the student Islamic society? <laughs> uh, so I started um, coming closer to the dean when I was at college. So my family generally is quite um, religious in the perspective of importance of prayer and stuff. They mm. always make sure that I would be praying, but that doesn't mean that I would be praying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my parents would actually tell me to do that. My brothers, and my brothers generally would, you know, they they would be they would pray, and uh, and you know my other siblings and whatnot. But then, I think I started to take it more seriously when I was at college. Right. And then when I was at college, uh, I had a new set of friends, so right. then I could choose the people that I used to hang around with, opposed to the ones who I had made friends before I was at I was that practicing at college. Yeah. So then, you know, I, obviously I joined the Islamic Society, got more involved, you know, got more active. Same situation with um, when I did my master's as well. In actual fact, the place where I did my university, there, I would tend to organise talks. But because it was a little bit further out of London, not, it wasn't further out from London, it was Brunel University, which is not that a lot of speakers wouldn't want to come out. Yeah, because it's a bit It's far. a little bit further off. So then I was kind of forced uh, to do the, the, talks the, the talks and stuff, and that's how it kind of uh, snowballed in actual. Fact. Alhamdulillah, yeah. that's really good. Like you're in a situation where you're following Islam, you want to, you know, share Islam, and you had to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. There's, there's... So it wasn't planned. It wasn't. I was planning to give, give talks and get involved and be on the, the the front side. I was more of the kind of like the background guy, the yeah. one who's organising things. Um. So yeah, then I wasn't really sure what I wanted. Things, I mean, then nine eleven happened. Um, Two thousand and one. Yeah, that's right. And um, and it's really difficult to get work. Um, and I do feel that even today, I feel that there is actually an element of there is difficulty as a Muslim to get into particular jobs. Right. Uh, I I actually feel that. I mean, mm. I certainly have anecdotal kind of like examples from uh, Muslims, even my own family members where they would struggle to find work simply because they, they you know, they look uh, Muslim. So I actually found it quite difficult to even get my foot in the door. Um, so then I kind of like went in a different direction. Mm. I started teaching um, uh, English as a foreign language and then got married and then went abroad and, and all that kind of stuff. Did you teach English as a foreign language when you were abroad as well? Yeah, but I taught it as a, as a primary school teacher. Um, so I was teaching uh, grade th grade three, um, which is uh, I think like seven or eight year olds. So I was teaching. I taught for about two years uh, abroad in Qatar. Although I didn't have a PGCE, PGCE, um, I did have a a CELTA qualification and I had some background teaching. Mm. And they they really liked that uh, the fact that I've got experience teaching English to uh, foreigners because then I could actually kind of apply some of those teaching techniques. Uh, to the kids, the, the Arab kids that I was teaching. So, but you went got there to study, you didn't go to teach, did you? No, no, I actually went there to to teach, but I was studying on the side. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the teaching was to supplement your income? Yes, of course, so yeah. Could, so you could live out there? Of course, yeah. Uh, to uh, subsidise your uh, classes. Were you doing classes? Uh, the, cl the, 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 when I was studying, it was free. So I basically found various people that I could study with and they would just give weekly circles and I'd actually attend those circles. Oh, alhamdulillah. So that's what it was. So it wasn't any, I, I wouldn't be paying for those. So did you go mosque here as a school kid? Yeah, so I was, um, uh, I was, you know, my parents would actually take me uh, to uh, to masjid. Um, so I suppose it was kind of like a madrasa kind of thing. Monday uh, to Friday. Hausa. Yeah, Monday to Friday. I think it was five to seven. Yeah. Yeah, it's five to seven. So you had a little bit of time as soon as you came back from school, then my parents would drop me off to the masjid. And the, the thing is, is that the, what we would tend to do is that we would just, the whole point, and this is, I, I think this is a big problem within the madrasa system, that the whole point was just to learn how to read the Quran and then just read it from beginning to end. And once you're done, then you can leave. Yeah. So there wasn't any focus on memorization when I was there. Um, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure that madras is uh, different from one to uh, one to uh, one, one to another. Um, so there wasn't, there was very limited Islamic studies. So this is a problem. It was very ritualistic, and we really didn't understand what we were reciting, and there was no real connection. Yeah, like, 
see, see I'm, on one hand, I, I, I was historically quite critical of that. But then on the other hand, I think, well, it's good we had that because we still had something for us to build upon, whether we agree or disagree with it, the fact that it was there. And because it's only been recently, I've really thought, you know what? I'm actually quite glad I went to the mosque. All right, fair enough. I didn't do well. I used to get beats. I used to bunk, you know, but... <laughs> I didn't used to bunk though. <laughs> um, and I used to hate, like, you know, like not seeing the end of, um, uh, what was it? He-Man. <laughs> All right, because they had little morals at the end of each episode of, you know, when, you know, someone's lying or hiding the truth and things like that. And then, you know, I'd, are we old enough for Thundercats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, that's another one I really liked watching. But we had to get out the door for to go to Madrasa, you know. Sure. And, and it's hard. Like, you spend all day in school having a bit of fun, come home, have a bit more fun, and then you go to Madrasa, okay. And... I never, I never had love for my teachers, all right, school or in the madrasa. My kids go madrasa, okay, and they love their teachers. And when I first realised my kids love their teachers, I'm like, oh my God, I, I never had that. I never had, you know, a teacher to look up to like that. And it, I feel sad in a way, but I feel happy that my, my, my kids aren't going that same route as what I did you know their maktab is um it's a lot more involved they have like um memorization they have uh, Islamic general knowledge and they have reading uh, Arabic and they once did this uh like a class for adults at UCL and um like it's on um, like a couple of uh, verses from Surah Baqarah and I went there Saturday morning gave up my Saturday morning to go to this talk and um, I was looking around at everyone. I was the oldest person there. All the other adults, they were like, like, like in the early twenties. And I and I looked at the guy in front of me. And I said to him, "So, what do you do?" He goes, "I go uni." I go, "Which uni do you go?" He goes, "I go Kings." I go, "Oh, what do you do there?" Because I do medicine. The guy beside me, I go, "Oh, so what do you do?" He goes, "Oh, I'm here at UCL." I go, "What do you?" I do speech therapy. Another one. Oh yeah, I'm at Kings as well. And I'm like. I go, oh my God, look at these these people, these youngsters. They're giving up their Saturday morning to come here to learn about Islam. And I'm like, wow. You know, I found that so inspirational that not only are these guys doing the best they can in the worldly knowledge, but they're doing it for Islamic knowledge as well. Because when I grew up, it's either you're a doctor, lawyer or an engineer. If you can't do those, you've got to become Hafiz. There was no concept that you could become both. Sure. All right. And and I feel, you know... But things have moved on a lot. Oh, they have. Yeah. So even uh, what you mentioned, I'm not saying that... I mean, it was really good the fact that I that they, we had madrasas yeah. and, you know, the fact that you can go to it. But I feel that it could... Imagine having you going to madrasa the way that your kids go into madrasa. And the fact that you found it inspirational. That yeah. your, your, your teacher's inspirational. You're memorising. You're not just reading something that you don't understand. And you know, I I, th I feel that it it, it, it could um, th there's a there's a th there's a real kind of um, connection to the Quran to Islam more, and it's not something just which is robotic and ritualistic. Yeah. There there is actually some benefit in that, but it has to be built upon. Yeah, it's a bit like when you know the first generation of Muslims from the Asian subcontinent came here in the sixties mm. and seventies. They established masjids only for the masjids to be pray. The function of the masjid was only to pray. Yeah. Right. But that was amazing and that was incredible. And what they did and what they established was phenomenal for, you know, first generation immigrants. It's just I agree. incredible. But you have to build upon that. You yeah. can't just leave the masjid just to be a place where that you just pray. It has to be a place where you teach your kids, which they that, that they would actually do, but it would be for lectures. It should be the hub of the community. This is what I mean. Yeah. And you need to keep progressing. Over. We need to basically the second, third, fourth generations. Uh, immigrants, we need to basically build upon that legacy of mm. what our parents actually, you know, established in this country. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I you know, I completely, you know, ag agree with you. It's just, and but now I think people are because like my my children go to um, Safar Academy, run by Sheikh. Uh, what's the Sheikh Hassan Ali? Sheikh Hassan Ali. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sheikh Hassan Ali. Okay. But big love to Brother Amjad who runs Edmonton branch of Safar Academy. 
Um, so it was really like, it was just by chance that my son ended up there and then the rest of my family. And and it is amazing how progressive they are. And the teachers are, are like uni students or college students as well. So they have this understanding of what wider society is f- and, you know, for our children. Because I'm sure my kids talk about things with their teachers that they wouldn't talk about me or a teacher of my generation. And, you know, I, you know, I agree with you. You know, the, you know Islamic, Islamically, we have moved on here. We have built upon it. It's just, we just, we aren't recognised for it. And we and, and we're not we're not appreciative of each other for it. We still uh, you know get hung up. I I'm I'm the same. I get hung up on the shortcomings of my mosque where, you know, there's no facilities for women, which is you know if you know there isn't there isn't. But there are other mosques that there are. Uh, but but you're also finding that the one the masjids that they are making newly, they do try to accommodate sisters as well, which is good. Yeah. Um, that, that's what I mean. We shouldn't kind of um, shortchange the legacy that yeah. our the first generation did, but we should just build upon it. So mm. any new masjids, no, they have to have, you know, like accommodation for sisters, and they should, you know, uh, if the if it's possible, you know, because sometimes it's not always possible to no. do these things due to funds and and whatnot. And there may be a masjid around the corner which does which actually does. facilitate that. But I mean, even I mean. Honing into the discussion of of parents and and, and parenting in in particular, and and in particular the the role of fathers as well, mm. I think that's also changed as well. I mean, I'm going to put a very stereotypical kind of uh, you know Asian first immigrant kind of migrant uh, you know father coming to the UK, and that is that they're working like two or three jobs, and even the mother is working two or three jobs, and the kids are basically you know. Uh, neglected in that perspective but at the same time they've been they're not neglected from another perspective and that is that you know uh, they're shown love not in terms of uh, you know like hugs and kisses and praises and you know pre, you know words of appreciation but more the case of you know I'm came to this country in order to give you a better education yeah. I'm I'm basically putting roof of your head obviously these are things which a parent has to do anyway but the point is, is that th- that's the kind of relationship that I had with my father mm. in that, you know, he wouldn't necessarily show me his love through the stuff that he, um, you know, that he's, you know, uh, through hugs and kisses and that kind of stuff. But it was more about what he did for me and the sacrifices that he made yeah. for me. Right. But I-, I was a little bit different as well, because I'm the youngest of five children. And I was uh, the-, the age gap between me and the next one is about eight years. Wow. So, yeah. So. And my old, the, the the age gap between me and the eldest is about 16, 17 years. So the thing is, is that um, at that time, my parents were a lot more economically stable uh, and I felt a lot more love um, simply because it wasn't just my parents who were bringing me up, but my other brothers and sisters were bringing me up as well. Alhamdulillah. But my, pe- my father um, uh, was more of that mentality, that kind of typical, stereotypical Asian kind of father that they don't really hug and kiss and but i i realized like the stuff that he did for me yeah. you know it's just like you know he paid for my master he paid me to you know paid uh, for me to go on umrah right, regularly with him and, and hajj and all of that incredible stuff right so um but again i think that 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 as an example we shouldn't necessarily say that was bad it was just that was the culture yeah and we need to build upon that so, for instance, with, you know, I've got two daughters. I've got one daughter who's five years old, another who's two. Alhamdulillah. Um, and it's just, um, it's really showing, like, um, you know, there's that that's there's a really good book. I'm, I'm sure you've read it. It's called The Five Languages of Love. You may or may not heard about it. Okay. So this is, it's a really good book. It's Five a, Languages of Love. Yeah. Who's it by? I can't remember. I'm not sure. Um, but it's written by someone who talks about how love is not just, there's no one, there's, there's different ways you can express your love, yeah. right? So one of the ways is through um, acts of service. So you do things for someone. Yeah. Another way is to give gifts. Another yeah. way is to kind of like hugs and kisses. Another yeah. way is to, you know, do it through words, you know, that I love you every day. <clears throat> and every single person is different. Mm. Yeah. All these things have to be implemented, but there's a priority. There's yeah. actually something that you can do that really connects and a person really appreciates. So for instance, I'll give you an example. I give gifts to my to my wife, and I don't know what to get her. By the way, after eight years of marriage, I still don't know what to get her. Get her, but get her experiences. 
best you could, best gifts you can get. No, but that's my point though. It's it's not just that that will be something else that may come come under um, acts of service. Mm. Do you understand my point? So if you take her on a holiday, that's more of a that's a different that's a different language a lot. But to actually give her something physical in terms of a gift. She doesn't read. It's not like a really big thing for her because yeah, it doesn't yeah. work with her because that's not her language in which yeah. she can connect with. But what she does actually connect with is something completely different. Like I do things for her. She really appreciates that. Spend right? time with her. Yeah, she really appreciates that. So I think that it's important to, and they've actually got a children's version of that as well. So you. Oh, there was a children's book. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's for it's for adults. It's for it's for for um, uh, couples, right? So you can actually you need to kind of engage and try to. I feel that it's important to do all those use all those languages um and uh, but then during the, there is actually a way of trying to discern try to find out what language works more yes uh, so for instance I, i'll give you an example uh so with my with my daughters uh one of the things that i try to do every single day is to hug and kiss them and say that i love you right oh, I, I always try to do that every single day um and you know it's like um and they they reciprocate that mm. and that's really important as a parent when you actually your your child sees you like what how do you interact with your wife and this is the thing um generally speaking uh when you when you don't see uh love between your father and your mother then you think that's that's how a couple that is should normal. be yeah, yeah that is normal and that's dangerous that's dangerous i feel that that can be that can be well, quite dangerous there's an extension to you know the i love you that you're doing sure. to your children okay now 30 years down the line okay your children and child are married they'll do the same to their children but if they don't see you doing it to your parents ah, when yeah. they get older agreed they won't do it to you and this is where sometimes i i hear parents talking about i did so much for my children they've grown up and they don't look me and i think well what did you do for your parents for your children to recognize this is normal behavior yeah the more you do for your this it's like um this is this book story it's a joke or a story it might be real for all i know so basically um there's a husband and wife and they had the uh the his dad living with them he was in a wheelchair he was a bit of a burden and um and the husband and wife was like you know talking they go look you know what he's a burden we should just get rid of him you know this, this, this you know because he's just you know he does, does nothing for us so the dad's in a wheelchair so the son takes him out in a wheelchair and he takes him out to the river and he goes you know what i'll just push him into the river he you know that's what he's done and his dad started crying because his dad realized what, what was going on and then his dad started laughing and his son goes to him well i can understand why you're crying but why are you laughing he goes because i did the same thing to my parents mm. and at that point the son realized brought him back home and he treated his parent with the love and respect that he you know as a child should do to parent irrespective of how the parent brought up the child because you're not doing it to you know uh, compensate for what the uh, your parents did for you as a child you're doing it as an example to show your children what it means to be a dutiful uh child to your parents yeah. so you know there is, and and this is a lot of people just misunderstand this it's just like i do it for you you do it for me without the you know if i do him something i get they don't understand like if you do something good for someone eventually that good will come back to you in an in an action nothing bad comes from good Sure. It's just sometimes we just don't. No, that's that's a really it. good point. So it's not just showing love to your wife or the husband showing a wife showing love to her husband that the kids actually pick up on. But it's also the relationship that you have with your parents for yeah. sure. And and that's something which happen. That, that's something which is in the Quran as well. So Allah Jalla wa Allah He says, "Nahnu narzuqukum wa iyyakum, wa nahnu narzuqukum wa iyyahum." So the, the the translation of those two verses is that Allah Jalla, the backdrop of this is that. لا تقتلوا أولادكم بالإملاق. That do not kill your children through due to poverty, mm. because we will provide risk or provision because of your children. Yes. Or another way that Allah says says this elsewhere in the Quran that we provide uh, your risk for your children because of you. Yes. So there's a risk, risk, uh, reciprocity. reciprocity. Yeah. Like for instance, like 
You know the du'a, the, the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the du'a of the parents for the child is accepted. Yeah. But what people tend to forget is that there is another hadith where the du'a of the children for the parents is also accepted. Alhamdulillah. Unconditionally. Uh, I, I, yeah, obviously there's conditions for du'a. So you can't like, <laughs> for instance, you can't make du'a for something, something which is haram. No, yeah, the du'a yeah, has to be, yeah. you know, the person has to be making halal risk. There's all yeah. those kind it's of like, conditions. It's, it's like the uh, du'a of a musafir. They say, you know, we'll always be, you know. Oh yeah, accepted. yeah. From that perspective, yes. Yeah. If you make, yeah, sorry. If you make <laughs> that perspective, so there's there's this um, incredible relationship that happens between the the the, the parents and the children. And then, um, uh, and the children for the parents as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's, we sometimes, I mean, to be fair, we some we sometimes just focus on the rights that the the parents have over the children, but not the other way around. Yeah, and that tends to get neglected. 